Welcome to Bloomsburg Southern Baptist Church. Those of you who are on the internet following us, we want you to be more than welcome to listen in and share with us as we go. You might want to grab your Bible and turn to John chapter 10 before we start, especially if you're at home. And if you're here in the presence, get a hold of the outline and turn it over. <laughs> because we're going to do something a little bit later with the reading of John chapter 10, verses 1 to 11, 1 to 10. Let us bow in prayer before we begin this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the beautiful weather. Thank you for the opportunity of coming together to worship you. On this holiday weekend, we thank you that we've taken the time to come to your house to worship and to serve you. We pray for your guidance and direction this morning. As we look into your word. In our Savior's name we pray. We've been considering, at least for a few weeks when I've been up here, the I Ams in the Gospel of John. And as we looked, the first one we looked at was I Am the Bread of Life. And Jesus made that statement after he had fed the 5,000 people, assuring them that not only did he give them physical bread, but he is the bread spiritually in our lives. And then the second thing we looked at was about two weeks ago, I am the light of the world. Jesus provides the spiritual food. He provides the light we need to grow spiritually as well. Today I want to look at the third of these that are mentioned in the Gospel of John. It is I am the door. We're having a coordination. Wonderful. We're doing great. <laughs> but it's going to get worse. <laughs> All right. I am the door. Now I'd like to read John chapter 10. And if you would, I'd like you to turn with the back of these. And we're going to read it responsibly. Now, I would never, ever, ever try this in a Spanish-speaking country. Because when people read Spanish, some go... Some go, but you just doesn't work. We're going to try reading this responsibly. I'll read the light colored passage verses, the odd verses, and you read the even. And if you're at home, get out your Bible and follow along with us. Most, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, who climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, who will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus, Jesus used this illustration, but they, they did, did not understand, understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said again to, to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All oh, whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Thief does not come except to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Okay, verse 9 of that section is the key to our study today. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. That simple statement holds a lot of meaning and has some really important things about, to say about the way to heaven. You know, we're very familiar with doors. School just started. In the last few years, classroom doors have taken on a great new significance. Where there used to be glass doors, uh -uh. solid doors or a door with a little hand. Teachers have ways of shutting the door and not locking the door so that students can come in and out. They have a thing they slip over the latch. Doors can be shut, but they're not locked. 
If something is announced about an intruder, they pull it and the door is locked. Or they have a little magnet hiding. And then I was in a classroom in high school. There's a little slit window about that wide going down the side. And they had on the inside of that door a little thing that rolled down and covered the glass so nobody could see in if there was an intruder announced in the building. Those doors have taken on a really new significance. But there are many types of doors. There are trap doors, stage doors, swinging doors, blind doors, overhead doors, French doors, sliding doors, louver, pet, pocket, automatic, and even a blast-proof door. And you can make your choice of doors for the front of your house, obviously. There are also commercial doors. Most of those commercial doors are manufactured in Bloomsburg by Conair. The upper left hand corner, upper, yeah, <laughs> upper left hand corner, I have to look. Okay. Shows a set of doors on a church. Now that happens to be a Methodist church because I see the symbol in the window. But those doors very much similar to the doors around the church that I pastored near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they were, interestingly enough, made by Conair. So were the AutoZone doors, but I had a key for it one time. <coughs> and the other doors. Also, there are not only those doors that we see, but there are mall doors, pull-up doors, that we don't see very often, except if we get to the pharmacy in Walmart <laughs> and it opens and you stand there and you wait. You've waited already an hour and a half. But they just opened because they were out for lunch. And they crank and they crank and slowly those doors go. Those doors were actually made in Mountaintop by a company called Cornell. Some of the fellows that I knew from another church work at Cornell and they do the programming and not the manufacturing but the programming of the system of making those doors. Look with me for a moment at verse 7 of that passage. Verse 7, Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. Now, we know that context is important when we're thinking about Jesus' statements. Context is important whenever we're studying the Bible. But in this situation, remember when we looked at I am the bread, the context was Jesus had just fed the 5,000. They were searching for him because they wanted bread. When he said, I am the light, it was after the temple festival of tabernacles, and they light the big candle offers and spread light all over the world, all over the city. In that context, Jesus said, I am the light. Now, the context for this statement is found basically in chapter 9. And I'm going to assign that to you from home. <laughs> Just briefly, this is the account of Jesus meeting a beggar. And the people asking him and his disciples, who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus said, neither. And so that the power of the Son of God may be revealed. And he heals him by putting clay on his eyes. He goes to wash in the pool, and his eyes become open so that he can see. Even more than my changed in my vision when I had the cataract surgery. He was blind, couldn't see anything, now he can see. But the Pharisees got all the pain. <coughs> he healed him on the Sabbath day. And they interviewed him. They interviewed his parents. And ultimately, if you look down to verse 34 in chapter 9, the answer is said to him, you are completely born in sins and you teaching us and they cast him out. They cast him out of the synagogue. Later on, Jesus approaches him, talks to him, and tells him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you who reveals himself as the Messiah, in verse 37. Then as you go down to verse, lost my track here, 41, very last verse of chapter 9. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin." Now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Now the leaders of the people were often called their shepherds. 
And so Jesus starts out in verse 1 of chapter 10 saying, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, he climbs up some other way as a thief and a robber. The he who enters by the store is the shepherd of the sheep. Context is important, but in this case, something else is important. The cultural setting of what Jesus is saying and what Jesus is talking. Of all domestic animals, sheep are the most helpless. I want to tell you a little secret. One day I was preaching in a church. They were looking for a pastor, and I was preaching. They thought they wanted to pay that. They didn't. <laughs> and I talked about how sheep are so stupid, how they do dumb things. And guess what? The family that took us out for dinner raised sheep. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't serve sheep, mutton, <laughs> or lamb for the meal. The sheep are helpless. They'll spend their whole day grazing, wandering from place to place, never looking up and get lost. I found that out as I was driving to church one Sunday, past the sheep farm, and there were two or three sheep in the middle of the road. They didn't have any idea where they were, but they were there. They were incapable of finding their way home. They can't find the sheepfold if it's in view. Sheep are easily susceptible to injuries. They're utterly helpless against predators. A wolf gets in the sheep pen. They don't fight. They don't run. They all huddle up so the sheep the wolf can get them all. They're totally dependent on the shepherd. Shepherds were inseparable from their flocks. Shepherds would lead the sheep to safe places to graze and make <coughs> Then lie down for several hours in a shady place. If you read through Psalm 23, you'll see that. Make it then to lie in green pastures and restore my soul. Then as night fell, the shepherd would lead the sheep to the protection of a sheepfold. Now, there were two types of sheepfolds. The first would be found in a village or a city. It's a public sheepfold. Now listen to me. Alistair Begg talked about this. He said it was a communal sheepfold. And it was. It was a communal sheepfold. Every shepherd that was out in the area would bring his sheep to that fold. He would let them in. A porter or someone in charge would take care of them. Each flock would go in. And in the morning, after the shepherd had gotten his rest, he'd come back. And he'd call his sheep. They would come to him. I lost them, sorry. They would come to him. He called them by name. Hey, brown face. Hey, speckled one. Whatever. They would come. They know his voice and they would come. The other sheep that were not his sheep would not come. He would take them out. Now, the shepherd would call them. Would, they would. And notice, shepherds don't drive sheep. They lead sheep. Now, the second kind of fold was quite a bit different. This sheep pen was in the countryside, where the shepherds would keep their flocks in good weather. Nothing more than a rough circle of rocks or a rectangle of rocks piled in a wall with a small open space for the sheep to go in. Now, through it, the shepherd would sometimes drive, but most times lead. The sheep in at nightfall. So there's no gate to close, just an opening. The shepherd would keep the sheep in and wild animals by lying in the doorway. He would sleep there, in this case, literally becoming the door to the sheep. It's against this backdrop that Jesus says in verse 7 I am the door of the sheep. Now, in these verses, verses 1 to 10, chapter 10 of John, I see three basic implications of the claim that Jesus makes. Jesus claims, first of all, to be the doorway into salvation. The idea of a doorway is as old as 
humanity. Doorways are places of personal entry into a secure building or living space. And the people of Israel were very familiar with this. I want to read some verses from Psalm 118, verses 19 to 21. Now, in this psalm, the word gates is used. And you will find it as you read different translations of I am the door. Some, people, some translations say I am the gateway or the gate. Psalm 118. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you. This is the gate of the Lord through which righteous. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. Even in the Old Testament, people were saying, open the door to me. Open the door of salvation. I will praise you for you have heard me. You are my salvation. Jesus is using that metaphor of being a shepherd to tell who he is and what all the he can do for anyone. Now, the claim that Jesus makes is stunning. The Pharisees were acting like false shepherds, leading the people in a way they should not be led. So the claim that he makes here is very stunning. That I, I got to see what you're saying. Aha. Jesus claims to be the door, the doorway into salvation. Psalm 118, we looked at that now. We're back to that claim. And no work that now. Okay, sorry. <laughs> now, Islam makes a different claim. Islam believes that Muhammad's teachings, and only Muhammad's teachings, lead to personal entry into heaven. But that's a source of a lot of conflict. I can't believe that people can see that there's a difference between Islam and Christianity. Jesus says, I am the way. Islam says, Muhammad is the way. But Jesus says, in my person, I am the entry point into heaven. If you want to get there, you need me to make it there. Now, we looked at Islam. Let's look at the Hindus for a minute. Hindu religion is a lot more complicated. And yet, in one way, it's a little bit more familiar. Hindus claim there are three pathways to enlightenment. Three pathways to salvation. One, enlightenment. That comes through, believe it or not, yoga and asceticism. The second pathway action by fulfilling one's duties, mostly to one's family, to his ancestors, to the family. And then the third thing that you need to do if you're a Hindu is devotion. Devotion to one of the major gods, to one of the major Hindu deities. And they have more than three billion deities. Gods and goddesses. They find it very difficult to accept Jesus' claim that I am the way. But he is the only pathway to eternal life. You know, I never cease to be amazed at how you can believe anything you want to as long as you don't narrow in and say Jesus is the only way. And yet, if we take the word of God, that is the only way to heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's not do what you can, do do this way, and you do that way, and we'll all get to the same place. And I'm like, no, that's not what my Bible teaches. Now, maybe we've Americanized those versions of the Hindu religion. How about salvation through education? Just learn all you can. 
and you'll be doing fine. Or salvation to having a nice family, raising them well, and having a being. Then also salvation simply by going to church. How many people are there in this world that end up? If only I go to church, I remember. All of a sudden, when I was in college, and studying to be an instructor teacher, I had one of our teachers tell us in a seminar class at the end of our, almost the end of our senior year, you need to identify with the church. Because that will let the people know that you're a very upstanding citizen. And I pastored out in, I'll just say Pittsburgh area, because it's harder to go any closer than that. That's where the Heights, Pennsylvania. There was a funeral director there. And every time I had a funeral to conduct with that man, he would go to his back room and whip out this Bible, and he'd show it to me. Look! This was given to me when I went to Sunday school in Calvary Baptist Church. Where are you now? All he got out of me was a Bible to carry around. Going to church isn't going to save anyone. Jesus says it takes a personal connection to make it into heaven and eternal life. You need me, Jesus says, to get in. How blunt could he be about it? Now, we looked at the first implication. Now, the second implication in Jesus' statement, I am the door. Jesus claims to be the only way, the only entry point into salvation. Verse 9 is emphatic. Notice. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He had said in verse 1, thieves and robbers break in and steal. Thieves in this illustration here, in the, what he's saying in the word, Greek words, thief is one who steals by sneakiness, by stealth. A robber is one who steals by brute force, pulls a gun on somebody, or whatever. Jesus says, I am the only way. That's not the only place that is in Scripture. Uh, John 14, 6, he says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Matthew chapter 7. He talks about two ways. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Again and again throughout the scriptures, we're confronted by the absolute uniqueness of Jesus. Jesus makes a personal claim that is completely exclusive. I am it. There is no other way. I am the only way into heaven. It's that exclusive personal claim that sets Christianity apart from every other religion on the earth. They have many ways. I do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. He said, you come to heaven. You get to heaven through me. There is no other way. When a fair-minded person reads through the Gospels for the first time, you realize that Jesus consciously intended to make this personal claim in all its radical exclusivity. Why did I put that <laughs> Jesus' claim is exclusive. John has written in John chapter 20. At the end, I can't remember the exact verse. He said, these I have written that ye might believe. There are many other things Jesus did. 
These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. There's no option. But don't miss the third implication in this saying of Jesus. Real salvation comes only through him. He claims to be the doorway. But real salvation requires personal John 10, 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Now, the New American Standard Bible translates this slightly differently. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The Greek word is translated by two different English words, either by or through. You must enter through Jesus. Jesus is the entry point. There's no other way to be a part of Christ's kingdom. Real salvation requires personal entry. It's not enough to recognize the right door. You've got to go through it. It's open to anyone willing to walk through that door, the one and only door. Now, people try to earn and work and do anything else they can to go to heaven. But you know, there's only one way. Rank or status doesn't matter. You can be healthy, you can be wealthy, they don't matter either. You can have a PhD or a GED. It doesn't matter. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11 says this, talking to Paul's writing to the Corinthians. Do you not know the Adon and righteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he adds this, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. They went through the only door. Jesus Christ, the way of salvation. How do you walk through a doorway? You know how. I'm sure you do. You walk through. She don't have to be told to go in. They just have to be led. They don't debate whether they should go in the door or out the door. They go in. How do you know that you've passed through the door? You must be loved when you pass through the door where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Your life will be changed. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells. The things you used to like, you don't like anymore. The people that you associate with don't want to associate with you anymore. Things have changed. Now, there's one other door I want to consider today. And that's a revolving door. There are people who look at a door and don't go in. There are other people who try to revolve the door. They come up to it, go around, go around, go around, and never get in the building. That used to be fun. Well, I used to go to Bible School in Allentown. And on 9th and Hamilton Street, there's this big department store that's no longer existing, S Brothers. And on 9th Street side, they had a revolving door. We used to joke, with them, go in the door. And then you get in the door, and you need to slow down so the guy behind you couldn't get in, or you <laughs> speed it up. Well, I think a lot of people come to the door with that salvation, and they revolve right away. Beloved, we need to get in to the door. There's one final question. Very simple question. And if you've ever been in Sunday school, 20 or 30 or 40 or whatever, in any year school, you'll know this song. One door and only one. Yet its sides are two. 
inside and outside of which side are you? One door and only one, and yet a side to two. I am on the inside. On which side are you? That's the question I want to leave you with. Which side of that door are you on? That you become part of God's family by entering through Jesus Christ, who has died to save us from our sins. That's me. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of sharing in your word. We pray that as we look at your word, that we might turn our hearts to you, that we might trust in you, having entered into that door, and becoming part of your hands. In Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Just one other thought I want to leave with you, and I forgot it. I used to think when I was little, if you had a walk down the aisle, it said Jesus. I tried a couple of times when I was little. They won't let me down after that. Finally, May 26th, 1950, I was at a Youth for Christ rally in Shimoka, Pennsylvania. Heard a man named Stuart Handler. Give his testimony and save the name from Billy Graham Crusade. And that night I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I remember, baby. But you don't need to walk down an aisle. You need to bow your head, confess to Jesus, I'm a sinner, and need you to save me. That's all it takes. You don't need to pray for anything else. Now, you know, one is, as you leave, there's offering place.